Hey Siri, play Brown Sugar. Here's Brown Sugar by Dan Duo on Spotify. Why I gotta butcher his name like that though? I was just listening to the song two days ago. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're well. As you can tell from the title, today we're discussing Atlanta season four, episode three, Born to Die. Perfect title for what we see is gonna happen in this plot. Plus it also figuratively speaks for what's happening to our characters on a subconscious level. I think there's a lot to be said about what happens in the music industry to artists and this idea of legacy that's intertwining, not just as a theme of this season, but Atlanta in its entirety. So we'll get into it as we get into it. As per usual, if you're new to these reviews, what we like to do is talk about one plot and then the next, because as much as I love watching these things happen in real time, paralleled, it's hard to not miss something when you're skipping back and forth between, say, Ern and Al's plot. We're gonna start with Al, he's the first on the scene. And he's feeling himself after performing at what seems to be a bar mitzvah. I loved this. It's not very often that we get to see Paperboy reveling or being happy even. So it was nice to see him feeling himself backstage. And then a parent comes and we're up to the usual ish that we are when it comes to Atlanta. This man is saying too much. He needs to say less because all he needs to do is be succinct and say, I'm commodifying the culture here. Just teach my son, put him on game. But instead he does this and all this extra ish, but I think <laughs> Atlanta makes the absurdly normal absurd, if you know what I'm saying. I was laughing so hard and I thought this episode was gonna be a hilarious off rip. It was actually not as funny as I thought it was gonna be, but we'll get into it. As his father is following Paperboy, trying to convince him to put his son on game, Paperboy's not having it. Talk to my manager, I'm too busy. It's until the man drops a milli, a milli, a milli. That offer, bing, you can see Paperboy's like, I'm interested. I was thinking initially though, if Paperboy's selling out arenas, a milli for a week is not that much. I mean, I don't pocket watch and a milli is a lot to me. I would take it, trust me. But if Paperboy's allegedly doing as well as he thinks he's doing, a milli for a whole week of mentorship sounds like a little bit. Am I wrong? Next scene we see Paperboy enters the studio and he's not getting the warm reception we think he'd, he should. Instead, it's kind of like a, yeah, we know you. We got this vibe. And I'm laughing because of course we hear Yodel Kid going off and I'm actually bopping to it. And then I catch myself like, who am I? What kind of millennial am I? I'm spending way too much time on TikTok because why am I listening to the track instead of the stupid lyrics that are happening. My default now when it comes to new music is listen to the beat because the words are baffling to me. It doesn't make any sense. I love old school music because of the alliterations, the way they rhyme and metaphors and just the beauty and the context of the storytelling. Whereas now it's just whatever sounds good. I really sound old. What really got me with this scene was when Benny is just like, nah, my dad bought you. It's okay, just chill, take the milli. The bot me part was giving slave energy, but it was also like, I know what's going on here, which I can respect. The, the child was not about to fangirl Paperboy. He knows what it is and he thinks he's got it. When he goes in the booth though, I got back my millennial card because I said, what kind of nonsense is this Rick Rock TikTok? In comes Buck, which Paperboy seems to know. So I'm like, okay, he's credible. Behind them is homegirl pregnant drinking Capri Sun. Don't act like you weren't the one back in the day squeezing that pouch to get every little bit. It's making me want to buy some today, but I know if I drink it, it's going to be too sweet. But I used to love getting those with the Lunchables. Buck suggests that he and Paperboy goes into the next studio to talk grown man-ish. And I love the cinematography of this scene. This was everything to me. I just like that dark moody vibe as you can see the smoke in the scene and they're talking about things what really got to me besides the rick rock tiktok line which i thought yeah that's the type of music you hear on tiktok was when buck imparted on paperboy that it's not just about touring or saving that is the major key a lot of investors say whether you watch a video or listen to a pod or pay for a seminar 
It's not just about saving. A lot of times we're not put on game and I love Atlanta for the conversations they bring to the forefront on things like financial literacy. It's so essential. People of the culture don't understand it's not just about getting your paper up or stacking or saving or flexing on the gram. It's how do you diversify? How do you find wealth in other things? And as we see in the next scene, they start talking about YWAs and this MLM-esque seminar. Everything about this scene, honestly, this scene saved the episode. If it wasn't for this, it would have been three out of five stars for me, but this brought it up to four. I was laughing so hard. The way they roasted Paperboy, he's like, well, I sell at arenas. They came back with the, well, what about soccer stadiums? And you can only go so far, you're aging out. And why do they have to throw Chief Keep under the bus with those slides? Man was enthusiastic clicking that clicker though. I loved when homeboy was flipping up the paper. Only 80s babies, 90s kids know. If you don't, it's because everything's digital. I used to love when the teacher would call us up and we get to flip that big paper. I was not here for that squeaky marker. Sir, switch it out. The only thing worse than nails on a chalkboard. Mm. It has to use writing out young white avatar. Atlanta's so wrong for that. The saddest thing is it's true because as soon as he wrote it out, I was thinking of Usher and Justin Bieber. I don't know why, but I just kept thinking about how do artists diversify? Besides 50 Cent with vitamin water or Snoop with his wine or P. Diddy with the, what did he say? Tequila by a black man. That ad during Carisha Please is so cringy. If it's not Rihanna with Savage X Fenty, her perfume, Fenty Beauty or Fenty the brand, the label, how do artists move on and migrate out of music into something more sustainable? We've seen Paperboy collaborate with suspect companies before. I think season three with the Central Park Five jersey. That still gets me. There's a big conversation to be had, whether you're a creative or an artist, just anyone. How do you ease into the next era of your life, whether it's personal, professional, or a mix of both. And I like how these old heads are putting them on game about being the young one versus the OG with a little bit of sauce. Paperboy takes it to heart though. Next thing we see, he pulls up at the high school where Benny is performing and I'm laughing at this because it's so foolish. First of all, these students need to be in class because I don't know if this is lunchtime or what, but too many kids are crowding homeboy performing for free talking about stream live and DM me. It's really giving present day versus what happened in the past when you would promote and you do meet and greets and everything was so official. It seems like if you want to get on ground level, you literally have to be on ground level as an artist. Paperboy, not so subtly, offers to sign Benny who feels flattered but lets him know your boy Buck already did that. So only boy left to sign is Yodel Kid who I think is a better pick anyway. But he's on one. I don't know what he's on, but he's on one because he can't even stand straight while he's trying to hit on homegirl. Paperboy is ruthless, though. He's like, don't throw up in my car. Don't even lean on my car. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of months. I love how they pan into this scene overlooking this fabulous affair. Whatever this gala is, I think it turned out to be the Grammys pre-show. And the three men are there. I don't know what it is about this scene, but it was giving me a lot of the old heads in the industry that have co-signed artists. I felt so bad when Buck asked Paperboy if he was here for himself. And they start casually talking about, no, I'm actually here for Yodel Kid, 11 days of streaming. And everything that was said was so blunt, but so bad. It really spoke on the current state of the music industry. Hip hop initially was created by the culture for the culture to speak on the culture. The awards have changed to show a different side of what hip hop looks like these days. And having all these young kids who aren't black speak on the culture just really spoke to that. The moment to me really spoke to what's happening current day in the industry. If it isn't Post Malone, hope his ribs are okay, it's Jack Harlow, or that weirdo looking AI thing Capitol Records tried to sell, sign a month ago. Just know, just know, just know. It shows you how the hip hop group, or at least the category for the Grammys, has evolved and is not so pigmented, if you know what I mean. It comes down to the commodification of the culture, like I said at the top of this. Things go dark real quick when Paperboy asked Benny what happened to Yoro. He said, you didn't hear he died a couple hours ago. Died? He says it so casually. I said, what's going on with Benny? Because he's just too out of it. And we find out scrolling the timeline that he died. Next thing you know, we see Paperboy, Ern, and Darius 
watching the screen of Yodel's child's mom and kid with the kid from Ern's plotline accepting the award. And I'm like, what in the badness is this? But again, fact is stranger than fiction. How many people who've passed away get an award the same year? Just like Benny said, he's going to win. Now over to Ern's plotline. This one was giving me all types of eerie undercurrents. I'm not here for that, but let's get into that. Ern is at a meeting, which he's not having because they're trying to save this woman's ass who decided that it'd be okay to hold a gun at a poor boy trying to fundraise. I'm glad the ring caught that, and I feel like that's a true tale. I think Lovely T covered that a year or so ago. All I do know is that Ern is not having it. He's giving the energy that we as the viewers have. He's mumbling under his breath, like, let's just get a new client. Just leave this where it is. I always feel like that. Whenever I see people go to bat for these people that don't deserve that, I'm just like, why not protect the innocent instead of the aggressor? It just never made sense to me, but we know why. We know why. Let's not lie. We see him texting about D'Angelo's braid, and I said, where are we going with this plot line? He pulls up to this place that apparently, I guess, is a chain that doesn't exist in Atlanta. So alarms are ringing. If it wasn't the upside down sign, I don't know what it would have taken for Earn to go the other way. Because for me, I don't deal with no flip it, reverse it type of things ever since the alone. <laughs> you got to remember the YouTube era of Illuminati or playing music backwards. Ever since then, I don't play, okay? So for Earn to enter that room with the large bricks and the homie in the corner who doesn't say ish, I'm not here for it. I don't do horror movies. So this is... This is pushing it for me. Ern goes in, asks the man where D'Angelo is. He just subtly signals to the left and Ern goes to where there's a green tarp carpet, whatever, and lies down. I said, not in that fresh fit, which by the way, if I haven't mentioned it, I love how they illustrate the glow up and transformation of all our characters by how they're dressed. I love paper boys suit and all his outfits it just shows that he still got his swag and his style but he's elevated even Darius with his hair color that chris brown color change i'm not mad at it and then of course Ern is put together from head to toe his hair's not grown out the curls are popping a little bit i want that red jacket for myself i wonder if zara has it i can see from the music to the costume design a1 Ern lies down on this dirty green tarp pulls it back a bit sees blood i said if this is not your sign what's it gonna take in the background, faded, I thought it said faith, but I think those are just scratches on the wall, right? What did it for me was how they made this montage blur and fade into other things to show that time was passing. I'm gonna try that in my next vlog to make it more interesting. I'm always taking notes of the cinematography in the show and trying to put it in my own videos. It was everything. I loved how they showed his shoes. You could hear the tennis ball. Then you could see him scratching the wall. Suddenly he's like, I'm thirsty. Can I have some water? The man subtly ushers to the cabinet. This was the funniest part for me. When they zoom in on the Dasani and that's Ern's breaking point, I feel you. Whenever I go to a job and that's what they have on deck, I said, you don't love us. I'm quite quitting today because you can't offer people you care about Dasani, okay? I hate that it's in rap songs because it's not even good. It's just because it raps with... <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I live in Toronto. Mississauga is a borough just west of here, and that's where Dasani is packed. It's basically Mississauga tap water, and it tastes like trash. So that's why I was falling out. They really came for Dasani in this episode, but no lies were told. I don't know what came over Ern, but maybe he finally got what he needed from therapy last week because he sat down, tapped in, grounded, got all meditative with it. Then he started saying that D'Angelo is all of us. I don't know if it was in that comic book or what, but I was like, where is this going? The man gets up with his ring full of keys. I don't know what those keys are for because there's only one door, sir. But he unlocks part of the wall that looks like one of those crematory type things. And Ern gets in. I said, this is nonsense. No black man is getting in any type tight space like that. But he does. The room goes dark, screen goes black like it did last week. It's definitely a rebirth metaphor. It has to be at this point. We've seen it two times this season already. It has to signify rebirth. He comes through the other side, another old looking room. It's definitely something from the 60s or 70s. A man with straight back braids humming to himself. And I'm like, no, they could afford D'Angelo. He gets up, he makes himself a peanut butter and fried chicken sandwich. Ah, I was just like, what's going on here? This looks gross. 
I thought he was going to offer it to Ern since he hasn't eaten or showered for a week, but instead he takes a bite, puts peanut butter on his forehead like Simba and Lion King. What is going on? And what really tripped me out was the back and forth conversation. Ern's like, I really need to sign D'Angelo. <laughs> Was this a test to show my patience? And boot like D'Angelo says, the D'Angelo Initiative is a streamlined a network of men and women who X, Y, and Z. Let me know if I'm the only one who felt like this was giving Lost meets Matrix tease. I don't know what it was, but it was just so omniscient and weird. I was just like, we could leave this alone. But what really caught me, and I'm sure you caught on to too, was when he said, you've been having this reoccurring dream since you were eight of hands reaching out to pull you. How do you know it's not a good thing? That really struck me like, sir, what do you know about my dreams and how do you know? And also the power of perspective. When Ern spoke of this reoccurring dream in the past, it's always been from a horror and nightmare perspective. But what if he leans into that fear? What comes out of it? He ties and tethers in perfectly to last week's episode, his therapy session, and some of the things we've seen over the last couple of seasons. It makes me wonder what could come out of that. I actually don't want an answer because as much as I was happy about figuring out what happened at Princeton last week, I think this is better left to the interpretation of the viewer, if you ask me. I was just, I was really, just keep it real with you guys, I was very creeped out that old boy knew about Ern's dream. But we'll see what that materializes into in the next couple episodes and scenes. I love how this guy tries to get Ern to sign him. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm good on that. He's like, it's a lot to run this operation. No one told you to do all of this. Darius has no plot, but he's there chilling with Ern and Paperboy. And then, like I said, we see the TV screen where Paperboy's client and Ern's client intertwine. And I'm also falling out because Ern is asked by Paperboy, how do you do it? How do you manage? It's a lot. It's emotionally taxing. And Ern's honest. He's like, it's about survival. And that hit on so many different levels. There's a lack of connection between these two cousins as far as checking in. I really hope we get to delve into that more with the next couple episodes. This episode ends though with Ern going to do work, as he does. Darius going to party, because I mean as Darius. And Al being left alone, much like Ern was in last episode, to ponder his thoughts and play with what's happened and transpired. This entire episode really tied in well with the themes that we've seen throughout the years of tapping into who you are, discovering yourself further, easing into your fears, allowing the journey to teach you something and being open. I honestly don't think in season one that either of these characters would have gone along with whatever was happening for so long. And for Al to say the things he said in that Grammy scene really made it apparent that he's seeing the industry for what it is and he's now playing the game. And I like that, especially since the Nando's dude really ran with his money. It really is tying with a pretty little bow the growth and dynamics at play between these two characters and the parallels. It felt like Al was trying on a manager hat in this episode and it didn't really quite fit. So it was cool to see that and see that he has a different perspective and respect for Earn. I really liked it. I think I would have loved it more if it wasn't so heavy, but we need these episodes to have these type of conversations and discourse. So I wanna hear from you. Let me know what you took away from this episode. Subscribe for more and until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.